joined, and he, 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 he made a big pronouncement at the, at, during his inaugural address. And we had to set, you know, um, you know the ball rolling and um, set up everything. And um, with this, you know, chairmanship, you know, it would require also a lot of attention. You know, you just take, don't take the chairmanship just for the sake of taking it. You want to make a difference. You want to devote most of your time to that. And His Excellency would not have that time for this year. And he's not saying there is another year due. It has been a stalemate regarding the election of a new chairperson for the commission. With several rounds of voting, it is said that none of the two candidates in the person of the incumbent chairperson, Sam Ping of Gabon, and South Africa's Home Affairs Minister, has been able to pull the two-third majority needed. Meanwhile, Professor Jami has had tete with the Secretary General of the United Nations, His Excellency Ban Ki-moon. Such bilaterals are held on the margins of the summit to also allow leaders discussions of their own privacies. The Gami leader had a similar meeting with the President of the African Development Bank, and their discussions, according to Donald Kabiriku, dealt mainly with the bank's cooperation program with the Gambia. I also explain what the bank is doing in the Gambia, and uh, in particular, I thank the president for helping and facilitating mm -hmm. the building of this uh, bridge uh, on the River Gambia, mm -hmm. which we are entirely financing yes. through a grant, not alone a grant, mm -hmm. because we think that uh, bridge will uh, facilitate business. and within the Gambia. Upon the summit's closing late Monday evening, the Gambian delegation headed by President Jame made the eight-hour-long flight back home, knowing something meaningful has been achieved at the continental level. Abinjai, GRTS. Well, President Jame returned to the Gambia on Tuesday morning and was received on arrival by the usual lineup of dignitaries, which included the Vice President and Women's Affairs Minister, the Speaker of the National Assembly, Cabinet Ministers, Service Chiefs, and National Assembly members, among others. Shortly after the usual ceremonies, GRS Francis Mendy asked the Head of State for his take on the importance of the 18th Ordinary Session, 18th Ordinary Summit rather, of Heads of State and Government of the African Union attached to the Inter-African Trade, and this was Professor Jame's response. First of all, I want to thank you for welcoming me and I want to ask, uh, answer to your question as to what my take is. If it weren't very important, I wouldn't have gone. That's the most important thing. Because uh, there is no way we can eradicate poverty without intra-African trade. We cannot bring about economic integration without intra-African trade. And of course, when we want to look for Western or Northern markets of developed countries or Northern countries, who's going to take us seriously if we cannot trade amongst ourselves? And that is why, despite the fact that the African continent is the major source of raw material, we are still the poorest because we are dealing in a trading mechanism where we trade as individuals instead of as a block or as a continent, as a result of which, we are the major producers of raw materials for the industrialized north, but we are the poorest of the poor. Why? Because you go to them as individuals, they fix a price they want, which means take it or leave it. Now, when the only commodity, African commodity, whose price is not fixed by the world market, is kola not. Why? Because Westerners don't chew kola not. But apart from kola not, anything else, the price is fixed by the world market. Now, if you ask me, where's the World Bank, I can tell you, the headquarters is in Washington, D.C. The IMF, I can tell you. But who knows where the world, uh, the world market is? Nobody knows. Who's the president of the World Bank? I know. Who's the president of the IMF? I know. Or the managing director of, of the IMF? I know. But who is even the CEO of the world market? Nobody knows. But it, th this is such an invisible but powerful force that every year, despite Africa being the major, that produces, a continent that produces 98% of the raw material for the industrialized north, becomes poorer and poorer every year. 
I'm not going to, I'll give you a typical example. If there is intra-African trade, uh, we will be also a major consumer. Because we are a major consumer for products that are produced elsewhere that are rejected for other parts of the world, they dump them in Africa. For example, we produce co coffee beans and cocoa. Not so. And then import chocolate and coffee. Now you sell the raw coffee beans at maybe 50 cents per kilo, or let's say one dollar per kilo. And when it is processed, all they do is just roast it, that's all. Roast it and pound it into powder, package it, and you buy 50 ounces of that for three dollars. 50 ounces. How many ounces or 50 grams of it? How many grams would be in a kilogram? Do you understand? So in a thousand, in a kilogram, which is 1,000, how many divided by 50? How many would you have? How many dollars would you have for that kilo of raw, uh, for which you sold to the US for one dollar? Now, if we are to industrial, uh, if you are to trade amongst ourselves, we will also be obliged. You cannot do trade, inter-African trade, without communication, infrastructure. For some of us to go to Ethiopia, you have to go to London or Brussels or Paris in order to come back to Africa. So there is no African delegation that will travel commercial in 90% of the African delegation that go commercial would have to go to UK, uh, Europe, the north, and come back to Africa. But if there is inter-African trade, we will think of building roads. Then we will not have problems trading amongst ourselves. We will not have border closures. We will think of being African. In that case also, we will consume what we produce directly. But the coffee we, that is produced in Ivory Coast, or, or Guinea, or anywhere else, is taken to Europe process, half is processed for Africa, the other part is processed for, for them. Now, you will agree with me that the mango juice that is, the canned mango juice that you have here, sometimes you look at the tin, it tells you that it's made in the EU. You go to anywhere in Europe, you will not find that type of uh, mango juice or orange juice. And come uh, June, July, August, mangoes will be rotting under mango trees in the Gambia. It's indeed ironic that in those days, our ancest uh, ancestors, or not even ancestors for, for that matter, our gra great grandfathers and grandfathers, when they want mango juice, they go to the mango tree, cut it, and eat 100% pure mango juice. But today, you leave the mangoes rotting on that mango tree, because if you wash it and turn it into mango juice, and I give it a bag of it, and say, ah, boy, you have nothing to give me but this mango that you pluck from your mango tree. He wants one made in Holland. They also condition our psychology. And that is why, despite numerous health facilities, hospitals, doctors, life expectancy is very low. Because if an engine is made for Europe, before it is sent to Africa, it has to be tropicalized. Not so. Why? Because it's coming to a different, it, it, it will still be a petrol engine uh, vehicle, but it's meant for Europe, a cold climate. So now, if we as Africans in the tropics, very hot and humid, want to live like Europeans in Europe, which is very cool, then we have a problem. Now you understand why children are born with strange diseases, despite the fact that the Gambia is not an industrialized country. Asthmatic patients are on the increase. Obesity is more, more uh, uh, rampant now than maybe 10, 20 years ago. Okay? What caused it? The way, either the way we live, or what